A huge good morning to everyone who's joined us this morning. Um, just to let you know, this event is being recorded. Um, so if there's any colleagues that haven't been, haven't been able to attend, um, you'll be able to share this with them afterwards. My name is Neil hudson Basing. I'm the Corporate Events Manager at London South Bank University. I'm just going to take you through the Zoom functionality. Before I do, I just have a webinar state, uh, statement that I'd like to read for you around dignity and respect. So everyone speaking at or attending an LSVU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect dignity and courtesy. LSVU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing, learning and celebrating and bringing communities together. LSVU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination. Inappropriate behaviour, including behaviour that potentially impacts or contradicts LSVU's reputations and values, will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any example of the above behaviour will be also removed from the webinar. We want our events to be an enjoyable and warm experience for all. Thank you for, for adhering to these guidelines. Um, I'd like to take you through the Zoom functionality now. You'll see three buttons at the bottom of the screen. The first one is the chat box, and we do encourage you to use the chat box throughout the event to share your thoughts and comments. Um, we'll be using it to share our hashtags and our Twitter handle, which you can see beh behind me on our back on my background. Um, our Twitter handle is at LSBU and the hashtag is hashtag LSBU changemakers. Do share your thoughts and comments on there um, and also with our panellists. Um, our panellists you can see on screen and um, they're about to give you a wave um, to say good morning um, and um, they, they'll also be responding kind of in the chat box throughout there. Um, we're really keen to break down the virtual wall that we're all facing in the absence of face-to-face -face events. So do, do share your thoughts and comments in there. The next box along is the Q&A box. I encourage you to use that just for your questions. We're very keen to distinguish between the chat box. Um, you'll see there's an upvote option in there. So if there's a burning question that you think that's great, I really want that question answered, tick the thumbs up and that will boost it to the top. Um, the, this, uh, the button along is the raise your hand function and if we have time for that we may go to the, for some live questions and um, the chances are we'll just stick to the Q&A box. Um, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Jodie who's going to talk about the change makers. Jodie over to you. Thank you so much Neil. So I'm Jodie Morris the Senior Officer in the Alumni and Development Team. So every year I get tasked with developing the theme for this annual alumni event and this is my fourth event since working here. So coming up with the theme for this year was particularly difficult for obvious reasons. We're all going through very difficult times. Um, and it's also the 10th anniversary of this event. So I knew I needed to create a theme that embodied the LSVU spirit. So one of my biggest inspirations for this event was what we saw happen um, during the first lockdown with individuals taking it upon themselves to help others set up food banks and create helplines, um, create COVID-19 mutual aid groups that popped up all over the UK. And it made me realize that people weren't waiting to be told what to do and how to do it because they understood that done was better than perfect. They understood that things needed to change and that people's lives needed to be impacted in a positive way. And I kept thinking about this and I realized these people are agents of change and it's a very gimmicky title and I don't like gimmicks, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. But it made me realize that agents of change are here in LSBU. LSBU has a lot of change makers from academics to students to alumni. They are people who are driven by empathy. They don't wait and ask for permission. They don't sit back, they get up and they do. They have a passion, they go out on their mission and they bring people along with them. I personally, I'm in, so inspired by change makers, people who don't ask for permission. I, I'm so inspired by them. So I'm really excited to hear from this panel today. And um, I just wanted to give everyone a little bit of context about this event, because it is different to what we usually do. But I'm going to hand over to Michelle Moore, and she's going to continue to set the scene um, for all of you. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jodie. And hello, everybody. A very, very warm welcome to you all today. It's my great pleasure to um, today welcome uh, Everybody, on behalf of all of the panel members that you can see on screen today, we will soon be introducing everybody. So my name is Michelle Moore. I am the Interim Director of Alumni and Development at LSBU. This is our annual alumni event, LSBU, the home of change makers. And the event is so generously sponsored by Hitesh Taylor, who you can see and we will hear from later. Now, this is our first ever virtual alumni event. 
And we're really, really delighted. Over 200 of you have signed up. That is amazing. That includes alumni, donors, staff, students, every single one of you, welcome. We're really pleased that you're here with us today. Now, we've got an incredible lineup of LSBU alumni and staff who are on the panel. You're gonna hear from them all very soon. I can't wait. The running order, we'll have the panel discussion followed by the Q&A. Don't forget, as Neil said, use that chat box or the Q&A. And please do use those hashtags too for those of you who are on social media. Now, all of us that are here today have a connection with LSBU already. You will know that since 1892, LSBU has been providing vocationally relevant, accredited and professionally recognized education. And everything that we do at LSBU benefits society and individuals. Our vision is to transform lives. As Jody said, LSBU is a space that creates change makers. Those are people who go out of their way to make a difference. They use their experience. They take action on issues that they're passionate about. They get involved in projects that change their local and their global communities. And they help people. Now, Jody said this already, but goodness, has 2020 been a year unlike any other in living memory? But what has been inspiring is seeing how people have come together to make a difference. And this is what we're celebrating today. So our main audience today is our alumni. We're very proud to see um, so many change makers in our alumni community. And we hope that this inspires you a little bit more today. At LSBU, we really care deeply about our alumni. And what we want to do is create opportunities for you all to stay in touch for a lifetime. Now we recognize you're all different. You're all gonna be interested in different things, different parts of the university, but we do hope that you enjoy receiving the newsletters, the communications that we send out to you. We hope that you all know about the benefits that you get as being an alumni. This includes you get discounted rate for further study, you get access to employability support, and of course, the opportunity to attend free events with inspiring speakers like we have today. Some of you generously give back, and for that, I would like to thank you. So for those of you that have been involved in a career panel, shared your story with us, helped inspire students with a message during what's been an incredibly difficult academic year, thank you. And for those of you that donated to support students in need this year, thank you. This year, I just want to tell you a couple of stories. We had alumni that very kindly volunteered to give their time at our first ever virtual open day. Now, just imagine there's no doubt that these prospective students that were coming to find out about LSBU, about what it's like to study here, they were feeling pretty nervous, probably even more so doing it all online through a screen. But our very friendly, very welcoming alumni, they were there in the virtual chat rooms, they were giving talks, they were helping, they were providing reassurance and that first hand experience of what LSVU is like. So thank you for those of you that took part. If anyone else is interested in this kind of thing, get in touch, we can tell you a little bit more. Um, I'm sure there are students now enrolled at LSVU that would have come to one of those open days earlier this year. Also in 2020, we started fundraising to support some of the students that were inadvertently affected by the coronavirus pandemic. This included um, some of our student nurses. Now they were on the front line. Just think back to April, uh, March, April, May, those early days of the pandemic. Those student nurses were in the hospitals completing their training. They were exposed to some things that were difficult for healthcare professionals with decades of experience. Never mind someone's just starting out. Um, and some of them were worried about the health of their families at home, and they had to balance that need to self-isolate alongside doing their key worker roles. Sometimes they lost income because they weren't able to go to work. Libraries had to close. We were very sad, and the minute we were allowed to open them, we, we opened the doors again. But we did, we were forced by the government, we had to close the libraries at LSBU. So many students relied on them, they needed IT equipment to study. So what we did, our LSBU community, LSBU resources, together with our alumni and our donor community, rallied together to help this group 
and we provided a financial lifeline, a, a small grant to help some of these students. Um, over 800 students received uh, help like this. And in the words of one of the students who receives some of this money, it's hard to balance childcare, work and studying. Extra funds can help to take the pressure away. So this is some of the ways that you alumni make a difference to LSBU today. Thank you, it's amazing. You are really helping the next generation of change makers. And what we want to do, what this event is to, to, all about today is about us giving something back to you. You are our amazing community. You're all out there, alumni, friends, donors, supporters. This is for you. We really, really hope you enjoy it. Now, I'm going to pass over to our inspirational host for the day, Kay Scorer. Thank you so much, Michelle and Jody and Neil. Uh, I, I note that on the agenda, I am down as LSBU supporter. And I'm just gonna say a couple of words about why LSBU is so important to me. As a non-alumna, I started working with LSBU perhaps four years ago. And I've worked with some of the most inspirational people that I have ever met there. It has a place in my heart because in 1972, I was the first in my family ever to go to university. And I went to King's, which as you probably know, is a fairly high status upscale place. And as a working class kid from Sheffield, I really struggled. So when I found out about LSBU's mission and vision, it made me feel like, oh my God, I wish that had been around when I was 18. But also I'd like to touch on something that Jody said about the power of the individual to make change, about not waiting for permission. When I was a very small child, and this is gonna be shocking for some of you to hear, in Sheffield, black people were not allowed to sit downstairs on a double-decker bus. They had to go upstairs. And I would travel on the bus with my fierce feminist grandmother. And if a black person got on the bus, she would firmly take them by the arm, sit them down next to us, and then look around with that challenging, scary scorer glare, as if daring anyone to say anything. Now, she was not a politician. She wasn't even in local government, but I believe that she started change just by those small actions. So thank you, Jody, for raising that. I wasn't gonna tell that story, but you inspired me to tell it. So my role today is to shut up now. <laughs> and I, uh, I've had conversations with all of the panelists before this, and I'm so delighted to be able to introduce all of them. Jasmine, Calvin, Christiana and Patrick. I could have talked to them for days, uh, but I only got about half an hour with each of them. I'm going to introduce them one by one, just say a little bit about each one of them. Then I'll hand over to, to them. They'll tell you about themselves and their views on this issue for five or six minutes. And then after that, we'll, we'll have a little panel discussion and then we'll come back after Hitesh has spoken to us with your questions. So, I'm going to start by introducing Jasmine. And when I first started talking to Jasmine, I honestly thought that I was talking to myself. She, <laughs> she started life uh, as a physicist. Well, she didn't start life as a physicist, but she has a PhD in physics. And yet her mission is as a creativity warrior, as she describes herself, she brings together arts and sciences in order to initiate change. She's a great climate action activist uh, and she is primarily an artist specializing in 3D printing and AR. Um, she creates phenomenal sculptures that not only blow our minds but also make us think about the issues that she wants us to think about. So I'm gonna hand over to Jasmine to talk to you for five or six minutes. Thanks, Jasmine. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, not on mute. 
Am I not on mute? No, I'm not on mute. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Kay, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, everyone, for organizing. Now, I have a stopwatch because I know that I mustn't talk for too long. So let me introduce myself. Uh, yes, I am a scientist by trade, uh, now a practicing artist. I did my first degree at LSBU after having failed everything and crashed and burned really beautifully. And uh, love the place because it gives people a second chance. And after that, I went off to UCL and did a PhD, really struggled with the mathematics, but it was at that point that I realized that the visual thinking that I had been doing since I was a kid, um, as an only child, uh, there aren't many distractions. So I buried myself in books, God, I sound like such a nerd. And I did a huge amount of drawing when I was very, very young and always wanted to do art, but my family were immigrants and that was not the thing you did. You went and got a proper job. Uh, guess what, I, I'm an artist now, so <laughs> whatever it is you do, whatever your vocation is, it comes around again. And yeah, so I was at UCL and I was doing an awful lot of drawing. I was going to an awful lot of drawing classes. And this was at a time when science and art were not seen as something that you did together. I literally did them in secret and I kept them in very separate silos in my mind. And I was also going to Goldsmiths in the evening and studying a foundation in art because I did not understand the language of art. I was brought up with the language of science. And then after that, I set up a consultancy. Um, I was doing outreach to teachers and to children and did some teaching at LSBU. I was bringing up my son, who's now a wonderful 22-year-old. And over the years, what's very interesting is 10 years ago or so, I, I don't know, somebody kind of said to me, how do you think the way that you think? And I honestly didn't know what they were asking me. And I thought, what do you mean? How do I think the way that I think? And I realized this, this kind of joining of many, many different subjects was something that people were interested in. And if you think the most successful companies in the world and invariably the most successful countries in the world are the ones that really embrace innovation, how do, how do we you know, create innovation? How do we create great big acts of paradigm shifting creativity? And so this became something that I kind of reverse engineered and we've all been mentioning the word permission. And again, the thing about LSBU and any institutions is sometimes you, it's only one or two people that really inspire you enough to kind of change. And I had one such tutor when I was at John Cass. And for the first two years, I was painting figuratively because that's what I did. I was a portrait painter. And he said, I've just discovered you've got a PhD in physics. Why on earth are you making this? And I still remember saying out loud, oh my goodness, am I allowed? Am I allowed to combine the two things? And it literally changed my work overnight. And I started building machines. I started involving the science. And then as the years progressed and I was doing more and more speaking about my methodology and my process, I started because I guess I, I had have literally spoken to tens of thousands of children and undergraduates and businesses and the environmental issue started to creep up on us. And I realized as an artist, I could no longer simply create because I could. It was no longer that act of self-indulgence. I had to create work that said something about society. I had to be able to get people to stop somehow. And that's the wonderful thing about the creative arts because it doesn't use words. And some people might like it, some people might hate it. And because of course of my scientific background and, and the engineers that I work with, I still teach uh, occasionally at South Bank. Um, I have access to so many different things and, and being an artist, I like to imagine that we're prophets of the future. We can link, first of all, we, can, we kind of feel the zeitgeist, I think very often before other people do. And secondly, we're very good at linking lots of pictures together to make them, I mean, I, this phrase, bigger picture thinking, but we, we really, really are. And the pollution thing really hit me four years ago when my son had a major asthma attack and I had never experienced that. And sitting in A&E in Lewisham one evening, I remember thinking quite clearly that actually the act of taking an inhalation and an exhalation is not a given. Uh, nine out of 10 people in the world breathe air that's of insufficient quality. Uh, more people die prematurely in the world from pollution than they do from smoking. And so I was kind of compelled. And then serendipity being what it is and synchronicity, two of my favorite words, I encountered a company that was making a material for industrial processes that could actually absorb NOx from the air. Um, and I started sculpting. 
uh, by hand. Uh, I do use some some sort of you know digital digital processes. And in fact, this morning uh, during COVID, we did actually manage to install uh, one of the sculptures at the Horniman Museum. We now know that bees, which were voted the most important species on the planet last year, I think, cannot find their pollinating flowers if there's too much nox in the air. And uh, so we put Flower Girl in the gardens. They planted a beautiful bee garden around her. And it's been a, quite amazing the amount of media and attention we've had because of it. And it's addressing pollution on the South Circular as well. And this, this morning we actually received, we were among 32 uh, recipients of an award for bees and gardens. So that's really kind of cool. I haven't even had a chance to, to read about it. And the, the thing about all of this work is I have had enormous resistance to an awful lot of it. Um, very often you are innovating and people are not ready for what it is you have to offer. The great thing about COVID, if there is a great thing, is that people have had time to engage with their environment again. They've had time to stop and think. And for me, certainly it's given, it's given them time to engage with things like art and to start to think about the, the very act of inhalation and exhalation, which we know COVID has, you know, it, it affects dramatically. So I was really privileged to be asked this morning to come and speak. So I'm just looking at my stopwatch to speak about change makers, and and we'll be discussing much further. But uh, thank you for listening, and by all means, do Google me or do have a look on Insta, and I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much, Kay. Jasmine, thank you so much. Um, I'm. Whoops. I've got something going off on my phone here. I'll just turn that on. <laughs> uh, I loved your point about permission. And I would ask us all to consider whose permission are we waiting for before we start to make change? And I also feel your point about resistance. It's when we encounter resistance that we know that we're onto something. Agreed. So I would, uh, I'd like to move on and introduce Calvin next, Dr. Calvin Morley. Uh, again, loved my conversation with Calvin in the lead up to this session. Uh, Calvin is a holder of the Mary Seacole Award for Leadership in Nursing. And if you don't know what that is, then I suggest you all look it up later on. Uh, his mission is, as he puts it, to dismantle cultural racism and decolonize care. And I think it's very easy for us, when we are grateful for a system like the medical system, we tend to become non-critical. We tend not to look. And Calvin is a shining example of how we can stay supportive of a system while also challenging it from the inside as well as the outside. So without further ado, here is Dr. Kelvin Morley. Hi, thank you, very, thank you very much, Kate. I hope everyone can hear me. <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, um, I was just thinking um, when Jodi opened, she talked about uh, you know the title and it was whether gimmicky or not change maker. And, I think it also came out in my conversation with Kay. Um, I never thought of myself as a change maker. I saw myself as a person who was going through life. And I think um, for me, when I look at this event today at LSBU, I just wanted to think, I have so much of my life and my career I can share. But what I really wanted to share is a few snippets of who I am in my journey um, into living in the United Kingdom, where I came from, and also what I do as a nurse and as an, a nurse academic educator. So I grew up in the Caribbean um, and I came to London way back in the 1990s. But um, part of my journey is I always say to people, um, when you see me and you see me walking about campus, I say to my students more so, is that um, stop and talk to me and find out a little bit about me and say hello. Because um, I used to be ashamed, but I'm no longer ashamed of saying this, that. I went to school bare feet. Um, I was one of those people you'd see on like, you know, um, the, I'm uh, not being dramatic, but you know, when Lenny Henry and uh, Children in Need and Red Nose Day come up and you see, you know, help send a child to school or whatever, and you see all the children going to school bare feet. I was one of those people. 
And what one of those things has taught me when you reflect um, on going to school bare feet and where I am now is that um, never try to fill other people's shoes, fill your own. Uh, and that's what I do. And, and my aim is, um, Kay was saying, when I moved to the United Kingdom, um, one of the things is, um, I, and the lovely Professor Callahan is on here today, and uh, he um, examined my doctorate many years ago now at the University of East London. And um, I set out the scene in my, in my thesis talking about, um, I looked at um, culture and sensitivity in nursing and nursing care, because I uh, went to the University of Essex as a nursing student, and I um, was one of probably only four black um, students in the nursing, on the nursing course. And um, then it became really apparent that things we did were different and all that sort of discrimination. And that's where, what I also learned there is that when we did have a patient um, at the hospitals, it was very difficult to provide culturally sensitive care. And that culture often overlapped with racism, whether it was unconscious or consciously directed to patients. So that's one of my angles where I come from. And um, during the uh, peak of the pandemic and um, the whole uh, George Floyd, I can't breathe Black Lives Matter movement, I had a paper published a commentary at the, in the Journal of Advanced Nursing, where we look at dismantling structural racism in nursing. And um, I was saying to the panel earlier on, Patrick and I have quite a few crossovers in life because um, like Jasmine, we're all our Goldsmith College alumni. And um, I um, did a degree in politics at Goldsmith. And one of the things in the year I studied is the Berlin Wall came down. And in the paper on structural racism, I, you know, where those of you who, you know, write with groups of people in particular, when you have international authors, which we had on this paper, but I was leading it, is it's very difficult to get everybody's perspective into a coherent story. And I came to the conclusion of the paper and I had to think of one thing that really would set home. And I reflected on my years um, in my undergraduate degree in politics when the Berlin Wall came down. And I realized in one swoop, in one night, that wall that divided, it came down. And this is the thing with, for me right now, with dismantling racism in nursing and nurse education, is that there are things, organizations, universities, um, you know, bodies, communities can do. And they don't, you don't have to have a meeting upon a meeting upon a meeting to have a policy. There are things we can do that can actually break down the barriers and the walls of racism. And later on, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, the second thing is, um, I my journey and it's something that we're now seeing when we talk about decolonizing education and I know Kay asked me about decolonizing care but probably later on you could ask me about that I just wanted to share one thing um, in one of the universities I worked um, and now with, with with education we keep saying we need to close the awarding gap because we know students from black and ethnic minority groups uh, get a lesser good status degree or marks as such contributing to their classification than their white counterparts and I remember having a student I was speaking to and she said to me, um, she said, I, um, I said to you, you know, when you're here, you need to look at how you improve, you know, and go from 40 to 50 to 60 and, you know, start hitting the grades. And um, do you understand what a classification is? She was an international student. Uh, she, was, she was from African descent. And she said to me, um, she said, you know what, where I come from in Africa, I have seen my sister raped, my husband shot, my brother's um, beaten, she said, and we crossed different continents to get here. And when I can cross the stage and send a photo to say, I have a degree from London in England, that's all I want. And that story makes me realize people have expectations and we need, you know, this big thing we talk about universities getting, um, closing the awarding gap. We actually need to listen to the stories of people because this is not, uh, my time is going off. Okay, I'll, I'll finish on this note. Um, this, this whole thing of awarding a degree, it's not a linear process. There, there, you know, there are ups and downs, there are hiatuses, and we need to understand the student journey if we're to help them and understand how we close that gap. I'll leave that there. Thank you very much. And um, we'll pick up the rest in the Q&A. Back to you, Kay. Wow. Um, 
Calvin, thank you so much for that. So much in there. I, I love the point you made early on about the importance of speaking to people and also of the individual journey about not comparing ourselves constantly to others, but rather looking at where we have come from. And I, I know we'll, we'll probably come back to that later. Uh, I want to move on now and introduce you all to Christiana, Christiana Malam. Um, there's, there's big links between Calvin and Christiana. They both work in public health care. And what I was inspired by when I spoke to Christiana was her commitment to communities um, being able to choose the way that they are cared for. Uh, rather than being imposed upon them, but allowing care to come up from the grassroots. Um, Christiana is possibly one of the most terrifying humans that I've met in the past few weeks. She really does make change and she, she is a force of nature. She's been recognized by the mayor of London. Um, she was a finalist in the Social Enterprise UK Awards last year, uh, but I'm, not going to say any more about her. I'm just going to let her let you know. Go for it, Christiana. Thanks so much, Kay. Um, somebody like me just having six minutes is always kind of like a challenge because I've always got lots of things to say. So I'll try to focus the discussion around how I became the chief executive of the uh, National Association of Link Workers as opposed to dwelling more on my personal experience but of, of course the um, inequalities that I faced or that I'm actually born with um, did help to fuel that resilience. I mean um, back in Africa or Nigeria my parents are from if you're hungry well you need to struggle to get the food so you don't have some of the sort of in quotes luxuries that you get where nobody cares for you so people down there that are very poor they are naturally resilient because otherwise you just die of hunger so my background is public health and health promotion and uh, i've always realized that i was more of a grassroots person and i am not pro-establishment so I am pro new power approaches. So all along, um, I've been involved with patient and public involvement uh, programs or sitting on panels or on boards in the NHS, trying to give the patient and the public a voice and to co-produce things. So within those roles and doing health liaison and all of that, I was always meeting blocks and challenges and getting this bit of frustration. So I was realizing that the way that the establishment works or trying to get the establishment to help me to enforce change. Well, it wouldn't work. They are, they are the establishment. They are not used to new power approaches because new power is about sharing the power with many people. Whereas the establishment is used to power and control. And we know that a healthcare in this country is very much political. So it's difficult to actually have that balance. Then we had what I do now, the social prescribing. And we were having the people that were doing the job and the people that produced the evidence that social prescribing were works to an extent we're not having a voice. So you go to these large scale conferences and the meetings and they're having a spokesperson. Well, they don't need a spokesperson. They can speak for themselves and people want to hear from the people that actually do the work and not having a spokesperson. And through all these meetings and stuff, I was meeting some people that were equally frustrated. And we then came together and said, okay, we are tired of wandering around and looking for people to help to make this change. We did try to say, there's a problem here. This is what we'd like to do. And nobody was paying attention either because it's not their priority or because it represents a power shift. And they were not interested in that or they're not used to that. That's a new way of working. They're not used to that. So I came to the point and realized that nobody is coming to save you. You need to save yourself. So being a change maker is about doing it. You need to actually do it. And when you do it, people will see what you're doing. As long as you've got the passion, then they will follow. That's how the National Association of Link Workers came about. And we've got over 1,000 members and quite very influential in the UK when it comes to national social prescribing policy. And what the approach in my journey, what has been, I realize I'm the sort of person that I like to empower people. And I do believe in human being. 
I know some people will find that strange, but there are some people that have given up on human race. I believe that human beings have the power and the capability to come up with their own solutions, the solutions to the problem. And poor people don't need rescuing. They don't have resources. If you want to address inequalities, and it's not hard to reach group, they're waiting for you to reach them. So all of these things of having that rescuer relationship, I believe in social justice. People need opportunities. I've had times where I will send email address, I will send an email to someone, and because this sense that you know I'm not um, English, then they don't respond to my email, whereas they respond to my colleague. So these inequalities and this lack of opportunities and all of that exists, and it's about economic equality and it's about social justice and people are capable of actually helping themselves and doing these things. Then we adopt the approach of having uh, that new power and what I've been doing as the chief executive. I mean, anybody can be a change maker. People say, oh, you're young. How old are you? Well, I don't care how old I am. I'm passionate about making change. I do my research so I can challenge you in terms of the my competence in what I'm doing. And I can also challenge you that your old power will not working because we have not got lots of money but we actually has, have got influence. So that new power approach is drawing people, is empowering people, and it's just like a current that people are just, oh, this is energy. I wanna go where there is energy. So being a change maker is about understanding the spirit of collaboration, which some people don't wanna collaborate for reasons, business reasons or all the reasons, but being a change maker and being able to collaborate, it has made people that we wouldn't be able to afford. I mean, we just had um, the Minister for Loneliness and some other high profile speakers at our event that we have yearly and people just give up their time and they're just wanting to link in with this organization. It's that new power that is pulling them in and we're getting more of the workforce and more people wanting to work with us because the new power is pulling them in and it's about collaboration and you're getting offers, um, you know, that people that are offering things to us. So my, um, Thing, or if I leave it with any word is anybody can be a change maker if I can do it you can do it and if you're frustrated or you're feeling like you want to enforce change you need to do it nobody's coming to save you and there are going to be other people around that are all equally feeling what you're feeling is hard change is hard but when you keep going and you believe in what you believe in and you're passionate, it will come through, but you also need to then understand that the new power, the old power approaches, you need to meet them at the middle. They're not suddenly going to realize that, so, you know, they, the old power approaches does not work. So I try to meet people at the middle and provide them the outcomes and the evidence that what I'm doing is actually the right approach. And then the, that mindset shift, you would, you would get it. But definitely anyone and every human being has got the power and capability to activate their talent and to be a change maker. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Christiana. I'm the expression new power um, sticks in my head ever since we first talked and I love it. I'm particularly drawn also to your theory of let's not look for saviors, let's look for allies. Let's not look to be saviors, let's look to be allies. And I'm also very much drawn to your idea that if we have enough passion we will attract allies. People will see our passion and they will come to us to support us. So thank you very much for that. And I recommend that everyone uh, look up the National Association of Link Workers and take a look at some of the work that Christiana is doing. Before I hand over to the person that Calvin described as the lovely Professor Callahan, I would just like to remind you that if you do have any questions for us later, then pop them into the Q&A and I will try and cover as many of them as possible in our Q&A session. I'd now like to introduce um, Patrick Callahan, um, Dean of Applied Science, with a particular emphasis on psychiatric and mental health. Um, like most of, of the panel, Patrick is particularly keen on social interventions on the community participating in helping those of us 
with mental health issues. Uh, he's also, I don't know where he finds the time, but apparently he's published 110 papers. Um, so tell me how that stung one day, please, Patrick. I'll now hand over to you to tell us more about your brilliant self. Uh, thank you, Kay, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Calvin, for your continuously generous words as well. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and I want to share just some of who I am and what drives me. Um, uh, I hadn't given any thought to whether I was a change maker, as I was not entirely sure what that meant. And I Googled it once and thought, OK, if um, that sounds like something I've done, then happy to take the label, uh, if that's the case. Um, what I quite liked about the idea of change making is you don't wait to get permission to do something, you don't wait for people to tell you to do something, you just do it if it feels right and importantly. And, uh, and I can relate to that and that's what I've done a last part of my life. It's interesting that I find myself almost after a 33 year academic career where I've worked in universities in the UK and in different parts of the world. Uh, to find myself at the tail end of my career, and I'm a, certainly I'm at the tail end of my career, working at LSBU. And I am your archetypal LSBU student, to be honest. I left school in the west of Scotland at the age of 15 with not a qualification to my name. And I don't think anyone, myself included, would have projected 30, 40 years later and believe that I would have had the career that I've had the personal and professional successes I have had. And sure, that's down to my own hard work, but it's also down to the opportunities people have given me, the support people have given me, the mentoring and coaching. And the role modeling that I've seen in inspirational people has helped form who I am and how I behave. I grew up in a relatively poor part of the west of Scotland in a family, a very large family, Catholic family with very little money, but I never felt poor. I had a wonderful childhood. I felt love, not in a demonstratively visible way. There was no hugs. There was no telling people in the family that you were loved, but you felt it and I experienced it. Uh, and I never felt poor. Um, uh, you don't often when, when you're growing up. Um, my father uh, my, I was unfortunate to lose my mother when I was three, so I was raised by my stepmother and uh, my father. And my father was a very kind, generous man. He was not demonstrably uh, somebody who would talk to you, etc. But there was a couple of occasions that really uh, he said something to me that um, really stuck a chord with me. Uh, he usually was drunk when he said this, to be honest, because um, he, he was quite a heavy drinker. Um, and when he was drunk, he would come out with all these gushing emotional things. So he said to me two things once in my life that really struck a chord and I think what really drove a lot of what I've done in my adult life. One was um, the idea that if you gain success, you must always give back. Whether that's giving back time, giving back your energy, giving back your skills, giving back your, fine, your, your money, etc. And, and that's driven me all the way through. So I've never taken my success for granted, but I've always wanted to ensure that the success I've had and how I had that success, that I can help uh, uh, others to succeed and enable them to succeed. And the second thing he said to me was, wherever you, he said, wherever you are, whether you're with a prince or a pauper, treat them all in exactly the same way. And again, that's driven me, um, this importance of having respect for basic humanity and respect of people's station in life. And that has driven me throughout my, my career as well. Uh, I, the idea of a change maker is also, I'm somebody who is not, will not wait for something to be perfect before I'll do it. I just get something out there in an imperfect way and it will become more perfect as you put it out there and it develops. The Apple iPhone Mark I was terribly imperfect. And of course, every single reiteration of that iPhone has become, but if Apple hadn't got it out there at the time in its imperfect way, they would have missed the boat and the rest is history. So I'm all for nothing needs to be perfect, let's get it out there, let's make it more perfect as we put it out there, test it, etc. Uh, and that's really, really important for me. Um, the giving back has put me into, you know, given me many opportunities. I've been a fundraising coordinator when I worked in Hong Kong with Amnesty International, which was not my day job, I was an academic, but I did that uh, outside work and had the, a golden opportunity to get involved strategically in fundraising and 
really help to give back uh, to those to those in need. Uh, my own personal uh, charitable uh, things. And, and another thing that was really important to me, I've been an activist in the mental health field since I first of all trained as a mental health nurse and then went into psychology. And so I've lived my life uh, always in the mental health field. I'm a huge activist for, for mental health and wellbeing. Um, and for other, I'm also a gay man, uh, and for other protected characteristics, I've been a gay activist, etc, etc, etc. My approach to equality is, I'm not grateful for it, I'm not pleased for it, I demand it, I see it as my birthright, and therefore I see it as everyone else's birthright, and that drives me very much. Some people are gay, get over it. Some people are black, get over it. Some people are female, get over it. And let's move on. Um, so I spent a lot of my time working with co-creation models in my professional life, working with people rather than on them, based being driven by there'll be nothing about you without you. I use that in the work that we do with our students to try to create a really positive student experience. That's very important. Some people in my life have sometimes told me, well, that's not for people like you. I remember working with a doctor when I was a case manager in a drug dependency centre in London who said to me one day, well, your people don't expect to be educated. And I said to her, my people, what do you mean? And she said, well, poor people, you must be very pleased that you've had the opportunity to do a degree. Uh, it was, I mean, I felt very insulted by that, of course, but it was also a lesson for me that, you know, not everyone was going to be warmly embracing of who I was and what I stood for. But I always believed I was driven by a motto that the, that which does not exist for me does not exist at all. And I use that in my interactions with people who I'm helping to enable, get the most out of life. That which does not exist for them does not exist at all. And uh, there is no barriers to brilliance, if I could coin a phrase in that sense. Uh, I've also been formed by, I remember when I was at Nottingham and was doing a lot of work with a mental health centre in the community and the trust decided to close it down, the council. And I was approached by people in that centre to say, will you join our campaign to keep this open? And I said, I'll join your campaign, but not to keep it open. Um, I want you, I want you to, I think we should go and see the council and ask them to give us the building for a peppercorn rent, which they agreed to for a pound a year. I said, and I want you, I think we should run it as a social enterprise and the service users who are using this centre should be at the centre of a new system. I said, look, you've been marching for years criticising the mental, mental health services. Here's an opportunity for you to grow from the bottom up, the sort of service you've always hoped for. Uh, and I became a, a key part of that social enterprise and I'm still involved in that and I still keep in touch uh, with that enterprise, social enterprise. So uh, I was very interested to hear uh, Christiana's um, approach, uh, co-creation, uh, not helping um, to rescue people, but enabling people to rescue themselves. Um, so I'm a big enabler. I like to do a lot of enabling in my personal and professional life. In my professional life, I believe that universities are a force for good in society, but they need to make an impact in society. And so the giving back should be also at the institutional level. Uh, and, and, and really make a transformational change in people's lives. So that's just a brief introduction to me. I'm delighted to be part of this today and uh, I'll stop there because I've probably gone on long enough. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Patrick. Um, not least for finishing your talk at 11.49 when we were due to start the next section at 11.50. So that's scarily on time. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to be the first to commission the t-shirts with that which does not exist for me, does not exist at all written on it. I think that's a fantastic sentiment and quote. So we are getting some questions in the Q&A box and we're- It's only uh, fair, uh, sorry Kate, it's only fair I should uh, attribute the quote that was to the, the very inspiring Simone de Beauvoir. Oh gosh, well, one of my absolute heroes from my yes, teenage- so teenage I, read, I read her four volume autobiography when I was 18 and that quote stuck out and I thought, yes, that's going to be a mantra for my life as well. Sorry, I just, oh, that, no, only, that, it, only right I should- you, you suddenly muted there, but thank you, um, Simone de Beauvoir, and thank you, Patrick, very much. Uh, we, as I said, we have some questions coming in. We're open to some more. What we're going to do first is have a panel conversation around three themes, uh, which are 
is the desire to create change, nature or nurture? And I think um, we have a great panel to answer this question because as you've heard, they have come from very different backgrounds and they have certainly had life forming youth experiences, every single one of them. Uh, we are then going to talk about whether change makers make governing bodies obsolete. And I'm personally very interested in this question. Um, I, I am still struggling with whether we need reform or revolution. And I'm very drawn to the metaphor of bringing down the wall. Um, the Berlin Wall was brought down by individuals, not by uh, governments in the end. And then finally, we'll bring it down to S LSBU and why does LSBU have so many change makers and how can we continue to create change makers? So let's start um, with the first question, is the desire to change, to create change nature or nurture? And if I may, um, I'm going to come to Jasmine first because she's the one that's not muted. <laughs> There you go, the practicalities of discussion. Um, when we were discussing this, uh, it was the, the nurture thing, but you know what, I've been thinking about it a great deal. And I went back to biomimicry, which fascinates me. So in other words, the fact that animals have pretty much solved every problem that we have after four billion years of evolution. And if you think about the monarch butterfly, for example, it has to emigrate something like 5,000 miles across North America. And one generation of butterfly can't do it. It takes seven generations. So each, each one passes on to the other, the sort of that biological sat nav. So that, you know, that kind of blows my mind, really. So this idea of epigenetics and what we, what we kind of have in our genes. So that, that was one thing I was thinking of. But then, of course, we are a product of our environment and, and how we're, we're sort of brought up. And certainly, again, it made me think quite personally as an only child. I had to find my own distractions. I had to find my own imaginary friends. And I had a lot of them and probably still do. <laughs> so um, and and the other thing is it's about risk taking and, and being childlike. Um, NASA did an amazing amount of uh, research in the 70s on the idea of genius for children. And their terms for genius, I've always been fascinated by the idea of genius, but this idea to be able to think divergently, completely differently, until about the age of seven, seven something like 98% of kids are effectively genius. And by the time they become adults, it's gone down to 2%. And that to me, I think, oh, we need to address that. But when you kind of look at kids, they don't care, do they? They take risks, they play, they can look at a cardboard box and build an entire city. So it's for me, this change making, I mean, change making, I, again, what everyone else, I don't see myself as that. I just see myself as an enormously nosy, inquisitive person who likes to play. And very often the play becomes very useful. But I don't think about that when I'm thinking, when I'm starting with something. So I think it's actually a combination of the two. And I think I have an equation for joy. I think I mentioned, I used to use it years ago. So for me, joy was, was it passion plus creativity plus action? And I think both of those things come from a combination of nature and nurture. So I hope, yeah. Oh, and by the way, we become more creative as we get older. This idea that suddenly when you become old, you me, the more stuff you have to, to kind of make connections between in your brain, the more creative you become. And again, if you look at Nobel Prize winners and people like Darwin and Virginia Woolf, they all had their great successes later in life. So I get so annoyed by this bias of if you don't do it in your 20s, then it ain't going to happen. Nonsense. Anyway, I'm going to stop with that now. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving me permission to be creative at 66. That's great to hear. <laughs> um, I, I saw Patrick nodding along to some of what you were saying there. So Patrick, may I ask you to come in on this one next? So uh, you can imagine as a psychologist, a trained psychologist, I've dealt with the nature and nurture debate many, many times. And my usual response to it is to say, when people say is it nature, is it nurture, is for me to say yes. That feels a little bit sitting on the fence, of course. So in my research, I, I, I rephrase the question and I look at it and say, what percentage of the variance in any outcome for someone may be explained by nature, may be explained by nurture? And almost everything that we have, whether it's our uh, uh, eye colour, uh, the colour of our hair, our personality, there is a genetic component. 
uh, definitely it varies um, in percentage terms. So there will always be a kind of innate. I don't know, I've often thought, first person in my family ever to go to university until just two years ago when a great nephew went to university, he was the second after 40 years. I've often thought, I used to think as a kid that I wasn't my parent's son because I seemed to be so different to the rest of my uh, brothers and sisters and I had a very large family. Um, and, and I used to think, it just seems so odd. And my father used to just say to me, you're just so different. That doesn't surprise me, you're just so different. And I, and I never got to understand why, because my parents, I mean, I never knew my biological mother because she died before I really was uh, very old. Uh, and and uh, know a great deal about us. So, so, so the answer to the question is yes. I I look both in my research and and, and and other aspects of my life, professional and personal. I look for well, what percentage of something might be explained by nature? What percentage would might be explained by nurture? I'm leaning on the fact that nature doesn't define us. Um, nurture does more of the defining of us and creates the identity and and who we are. Uh, nature provides the possibilities and nature allows us to hopefully enable those possibilities to thrive. Nice sum up there. Um, Christiana, would you like to come in on nature nurture? Yeah, so I, you know, it goes into some of the things that Jasmine has said already around creativity. So I see us as human beings as creative beings that's the reason why some of the people that the social prescribers support, so when they stop being creative, then the mental health, you know, comes in the depression and then you wake up and be like, what am I doing here? Because you're just bored with life. So human beings are naturally creative. So that's where the nature sort of like comes in. I think we are all naturally creative beings. So we are in effect change makers, no matter how small. And sometimes when you talk about change makers, people are thinking of something big. It's not necessarily a massive revolution. It's just you are a creative being and you as being this creative being, you've got that within you. But it needs to be nurtured, you see? This is where the inequality and the social justice comes in. Only it's not everyone who is confident or maybe can be myself who is able to activate what I've got within me already. So some human beings, some people, they need that to be activated and they need that to be nurtured. And at National Association of Linguists, that's what we do. We give the link workers, the people that are doing the work, an opportunity to activate their talent and then we nurture them to be in their change makers. And then they go, wow, if somebody told me, somebody just said this yesterday, she said, Christiana, somebody told me in January that I will be inviting a clinical director to an event because we support our champions to deliver events themselves and they just can't believe it so she said if somebody told me because I was kind of like supporting her and she didn't believe it now she's got a clinical director of a primary care network as a guest speaker and she just gone wow so this isn't it we've got it within us so it just needs to be, what is it that you're passionate about? What is it that talent? What is it that thing that you've got? What is it that thing that you're hungry, or you're passionate about? And it has to be connected with an impact. It's not just about, you just want to make change. Change is about making an impact. So as long as there's passion, there's that creativity, there's the impact and there's the nut nurturing, then that's when the change comes to life. I love that, Christiana. And, and you know, this thing about we will have it within us, which also, um, links back to what Jasmine and Patrick were saying, that we are all born 100% possibility. And uh, we, I, I see that we have a question in the questions about people with different sorts of intelligence, for example, people with autism. And, you know, I, I think uh, everyone, irrespective of what they're diagnosed with later on, is actually born 100% pot potential. Calvin, would you like to add anything to our nature nurture? Um I was reflecting when Patrick gave his introductory um, talk and we talked about equality and that's something that nature, we are all born equal, we all should be entitled to, but we know due to privilege, this doesn't always happen. And I think the nature debate comes in really nicely with nature. Some of us are in positions to nurture that and ensure equality happens. And, um, and this is why, you know, we were saying earlier on, and I keep reflecting, you know, and even passionate, you know, am I a change maker? Like, I mean, these little things we do, we actually bring change. And so sometimes it's not the big thing that we look for in change. It may have just been breaking change to a small group or two people or one person, but that whole thing that 
you know, the nature for me, if I look at some of my work around equality and diversity and equity for people, we could actually nurture some of that in changing it. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you very <clears throat> much, guys. Uh, I'm tempted because I'm a researcher by training to sum that all up, but I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is a really big one. Do change makers make governing bodies obsolete? <clears throat> I, why don't I come to you first, Calvin, because you you are currently unmuted. I'm <laughs> I have to learn to mute next time then. Um, I now see how this works, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll change it up um, next time around, Patrick. <laughs> um, I think, do we make um, governing bodies obsolete? No, we don't. I think we need to learn to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things as movements we will, and we can see very much again how, um, you know, certain movements as we talk of, you know, things like Stonewall that fought for, fought for the equality of gay men. Um, you look at, you know, areas around uh, more recently Black Lives Matter, and we have lots of movements and, you know, they do things individually. Somehow, I don't think they make governing bodies obsolete. What they should do is support them and look at how we, we give our perspectives and we're invited to um, you know, sit at that table, as we say, and um, share our journeys and our perspectives. I'm, I think one of the things that I'm saying are people all may think that being a change maker or changing, um, it, it's not a linear process, it's non-linear. Um, and we, we've got to recognize that. So we need bodies to help us. Uh, that, that, that's my thing. Even if they're funding bodies, they will have fund some of the stuff we will do it and help us to get there. Um, so I think, uh, but we also have this individual role that we play as well in how we, um, for want of a better word, um, we protest and we become activists and we co-create with these bodies. But I think what has happened in the past is that governing bodies have always led and told us what to do. And we were very much the silent voice and Professor Lawrence Sarin speaks of the silences framework where we're screaming, but nobody hears us. That's why we stay silent. And I think now we need to look at really and truly how we, are, um, we, we raise our voice and we give other people voices to help sort of break down those silos and walls we have. That's, um, I, I love the, the screaming, but nobody hears us quote. Um, I'm also uh, struck by the fact that at the moment, governing bodies are risking making themselves obsolete through their incompetence. And I think they are currently open to hearing us, those of us on the outside. So uh, from, from your lips to God's ears, as they say. Uh, Jasmine, you were, you were both nodding and unmuted. So I'm going to move to you next on this one. <laughs> uh, something I've experienced quite a lot, actually, particularly recently. So if you think about the art world, for example, it's incredibly elitist. And I used to resent that enormously, still do. And I used to think, how do I get in the room with the people that can actually enable me to make the work that I need to make? So I had to kind of get rid of some of my cognitive bias, uh, which I'm still working on. <laughs> so uh, we do need the governing bodies, but the thing that we need to find is the language by which they can understand what it is that we want to say and vice versa. And it is all, I always say that art is about perspective, not just art, but you know, when you when you look at anything, you know, you try and imagine what was that person thinking? What do they want me to feel? What is it? I actually it's about it's about perspective and artists are taught to look. We really do look. Uh, and that's something I would say to my students. Don't draw a face with eyes as almonds. They're not almonds. Really look. Right? And most of us spend most of our lives never really looking. We don't really see things at all. So you think, OK, whatever I feel about you, I'm going to try and step into your shoes. And mm -hmm. One of the really good examples at the moment is if you think of culture declares an emergency, which I became aware of when I was working with the Hornham Museum. So they were the first museum to declare a culture emergency. What does that mean? It can be an institution, it could be an individual, but it means that whatever you create, whatever you're doing, you, you start to think about the sustainability, the, the, the effect on the environment. So this idea of transporting art halfway around the world and, and the carbon footprint, that is changing. 
And the other thing that I know is changing is that companies are realizing that they simply cannot make this quick fix, you know, growth thing. This, this eternal growth is no longer sustainable. And they're realizing that they will have to make more ethical investments in which for me, certainly the environment is a stakeholder, for example. Now that penny is starting to drop. And that's one of the, the, again, the beauties of the last six months. I think that because people have experienced their need for nature, the cleaner air, the greater acts of kindness, the, the language, you know, it's gathering momentum. It's still going to take time, but we can't, you know, and, and again, I think there's another body, I can't remember what they're called. They're trying to get legalization by which the environment is protected. So uh, we will have eco laws so that you can't just keep taking and, and but this stuff is, is happening. So some of the, I think the best lawyers in the world are all coming together without being paid in order to create, you know, um, ecological laws which can't be broken. So it's, it's happening, but we, we have to do it together. So we are, we do need to impact upon um, institutions rather than overthrow them. I'm very drawn to what you say about being better listeners and better observers. And I'm currently working on a project on code switching, which is the way that black people have to change the way they talk when they go into official environments. And we are trying to encourage people to listen switch instead of code switch. So instead of making that person speak differently, why don't you listen differently? Which I think comes to what you're saying about listening and looking. Um, Christiana, would you like to say something about this? Um, do we make governing bodies obsolete? I know you've already touched on it in your original talk, but please. Yeah, so I think um, it depends on what you're trying to achieve and what your impact is. So like for us, the National Association of Link Workers, we're very much grassroots and we're more pro new power. So when we managed to bring some, we said, what sort of board do we need? Well, we want to be able to do our thing. We need to be able to go. We don't need the bureaucracy. We are the ones disrupting that. So what we needed was an adversary board. Then what sort of people do we need in? We managed to get a few people that were old power. You see, it didn't work. You've got the new power and the old power with it. So that's not what we needed at that time. We need to have the grassroots. Of course, we have like a few more people with maybe some experience or experts in certain area, but it really needed to be a bit relaxed, a bit informal to me what we want to meet then you have some governing bodies where you have like silicon valley you've got investors you've got people that are there to make they've brought in money then the sort of governing body that they need is slightly different and what we're beginning to see is the private sector waking up and realizing that they need that consumer input and they are seeing what's happening around the world the new power is moving with forces the revolution i mean it's already happening now across the world and even before the advent of the coronavirus and black Life matter and all of that so of course they need uh, the consumers so they are beginning to have their own consumer led or communities where that is feeding into the governing body then you have in the public sector where they're beginning to have different structures within the governing body like for the nhs for example there are some that are led by a lay member so it's just member of the public but there's still a lot of work to do because the reason the public sector is struggling is that you're delivering service for the people. You can't create the service and then deliver it. That's not your remit. You don't know that. So therefore, the people that are benefiting from the service, they need to be actually be on the governing body. And this is what they try to do with the CCGs. They then uh, created the CCGs where the GP practice, um, the doctors themselves are on the body because this is made by NHS England and people that were not doctors. So we need to go a bit further and bring in the people that are going to be affected or the beneficiaries within the governing body because it's a public service and the impact we're trying to make does justify the need to have that sort of governing body. Rather than competing with or confusing ourselves with some establishments where what they need is just having the shareholders around the table and making decisions, but this is a public sector. So I think, especially within the public sector, that definitely has to be that shift. Otherwise we end up designing services and providing things that don't work. Excellent. I'm getting a very clear picture in my head of roots, roots and branches here, Christiana, that we need to be drawing our energy from the roots, which is wonderful. Um, 
Jody has just given me permission to overrun in this session before I introduce Hitesh by a few minutes. So Patrick, can I come to you on this question? And then I'm going to give you all a very tight brief on the last question. So do change makers make governing bodies uh, obsolete? Yes and no, I think. Uh, I think they can make them better, but only if they're willing to be better by observing more, by watching more, by listening more. Um, and I think some of the most effective governing bodies I sat on are uh, those uh, that are populated by change makers, uh, frankly. Uh, but I've also been in governing bodies that I felt were quite dysfunctional as well. And I tried to understand where that dysfunction was coming from. And I think it was the inability to either release power, uh, disseminate power, the inability to observe and watch and listen uh, more attentively, um, and uh, a massive, almost pathological insecurity about their ability to affect change. Uh, I would say I want to tie into this um, to move away from the idea that you know leaders are the people who are at the tops of organisations. They're often called leaders, but actually the best leaders are those that you know. I've got lots of leaders throughout my school. They do fantastic things, and it's because they're leaders, they're change makers. They do these really impressive things, and good leaders again don't wait. They just get on and do it. And whether they are the most senior person in the organisation or the most junior person in the organisation. And some of the most junior people I've met in this organization uh, overwhelm me by their leadership skills, their leadership abilities, and the fantastically creative things that they do. And uh, my approach uh, to those that uh, who I have, I suppose, some leadership responsibility for is to surround myself by really competent people and get the hell out of their way. Excellent. Excellent. If only there were more like you, Patrick. Um, I'm going, just to remind everyone, uh, this is being recorded. And I think there's such richness in this conversation that even those of you who are listening might benefit from listening back and please pass it on to others. Because I know I, for one, will be mulling over a lot of this for some time. For the panel now, we have one more question before I hand over to um, Hitesh for his words. The question is, why is LSBU home to so many change makers? And because we're short of time, I'm going to give you a real challenge, which is to give me 10 words or less on why, this sounds like one of those terrible Radio 4 panel shows, doesn't it? But in 10 words or less, why is LSBU home to so many change makers? And I'm going to kick start it from my experience with LSBU uh, with the words, Courage, encouraging listening. That's it. Patrick, you are not muted. Off you go. We're in an inclusive environment that enables people to thrive and people see that and that's why they want to be here. Great. Christiana. Yeah, I would echo that. Diversity as well is very important. Diversity of thoughts and equipping people with real life experience as well. Fabulous. Jasmine. Uh, resilience and bringing an enormous wealth of cultural diversity. Yeah. Nice. And Calvin. Oops, sorry, I was just unmuting. Um, I think for me, it's a place that provides opportunity for people who don't normally get opportunities in life. Um, LSB is a place that reframes the academic model that allow, and when it and by doing so, it replaces the silos that people work in and involves more cooperation and co-production in education. That was so excellent that I won't even count the words. <laughs> 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 and with, I've worked with a lot of universities and silos as one of the big problems. Um, thank you, panel, so much. We will be coming back to you in a few minutes to address some of the questions that the, um, the audience is giving us. And some of these questions are great. I would like to take a few moments to introduce um, Hitesh, uh, sorry, Hitesh Taylor. Um, Hitesh Taylor launched this event in 2010, I believe, Hitesh, is that right? Um, when he departed from the LSBU Board of Governors, uh, he is, he's, I've been looking, I've been sort of creepily internet stalking him. And he is one of the big giver backers in life. Uh, I don't think there is any positive experience he has had that he hasn't then passed back into his communities. 
So uh, I would like to hand over to him now to give us a few words. Um, th thank you. Um, first of all, let me thank the panel. I was really very impressed with Calvin, Jasmine, Patrick and Christina. It's always so refreshing to meet uh, and, and, and make contact with new faces and just be inspired by your stories. Um, so yet again, 10th anniversary, a great list of speakers. I wanted to thank also the organizers for putting so much thought into a theme. It's very easy just to have these Zoom conferences, etc., but to actually come up with a theme that is so inspirational, I think, um, is great. Um, my background is probably not dissimilar to many others. I came to England in the 1960s, a pretty much penniless family, etc. Awful grades at school. And then suddenly I woke up and um, came knocking on the door at LSBU, um, begging to be taken on their degree course. And uh, finally managed after a couple of interviews to to, 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 to knock the door open and they welcomed me. Um, and in a way the rest was history because once you um, got going and had a quiet place to study, et cetera, and you started meeting other people from different backgrounds, you began to have some hope that you too could play a part and have a successful career and be useful to society. Um, so in my not-for-profit work, I got involved with South Bank. I wanted to give something back almost immediately and was fortunate enough. I came from an accounting background, so I, was, I came via their audit committee and went as high as a vice chair. I was too young for the top job and I didn't have the time. Um, but in, in that work, one of the committees I was on was in those days, equality and diversity, uh, and it was my uh, my board in those days where we looked at the whole campus issues, really interesting big stuff that probably students don't know in terms of what goes on behind them. So I, for one, definitely think governance is important, okay? <laughs> um, when I started um, networking in my ordinary life, I noticed that wherever I went, I was very much touched by somebody who had an LSBU story. Um, and that really inspired me. So when I left and re retired from the board, I thought, what can I do? And I thought one of the things, here's my little effort at change, was that I thought we didn't celebrate success enough. There were some outstanding um, uh, alumni that were out there that we'd never really heard about. So I decided on these lecture series for, uh, I didn't know we, we, the money would last 10 years, it did. Um, and that lecture series was to celebrate um, alumni, encourage them to come back, not pull the ladder up behind them, but to give something back, stay connected. And um, that was the only uh, thing that I asked. Um, the, the university chose the speakers. I wasn't involved with that. I didn't want to uh, interfere with the themes, etc. But I simply asked each uh, person, I usually finished off saying something, was if you could um, find a way to inspire students to stay connected with um, LSBU. We mustn't forget that the LSBU story, I mean, if we look at what's been going on this week, the 10th anniversary of what we're doing here, the 25th anniversary of the Disability Act, something that we take for granted today, a hundred years for the armistice and this, uh, the Polytechnic, the Borough Polytechnic in those days, was very involved with that period. You can't imagine that the 1920s, they had new courses to help with that war effort. And that took me back to 1892 with the formation of the Borough Polytechnic. And I thought I'll just dig back a bit further. <clears throat> and it led me to a fantastic example of a change maker, which was the match workers strike in 1888 with these girls um, I couldn't believe it, you wouldn't believe it today, but working in the most appalling conditions, 14-hour um, work days, dealing with things like phosphorus, and if you made a mistake, you got a fine. I mean, extraordinary conditions, and somebody rose to the challenge, 
and said, we need to change this. We need to stand up and stop this. And it makes me think that what we've heard today is really a lot of social change. All our speakers have been extremely strong, this very distinguished panel. And of course, I come from a business background. But even in business today, and I think hopefully our listeners will be interested, there is tremendous amount going on in this country with respect to board diversification. And I also mean diversification at the level of the not-for-profit sector. Um, and the, the fact that internet access has made what I call asymmetric knowledge, um, almost out of the window. Somebody can't pull the wool over your eyes. You can pretty well look up information as fast as anybody else with an internet connection, which then of course opens up the whole debate about thinking for yourself and not falling for fake news. I can't um, emphasize that enough. And I, in a business contact, I think about LSBU and I think, how is it possible that we have Microsoft and Amazon and Alibaba and Google? The home of the World Wide Web is here. So I inspire our listeners to go out there and make some change, look for opportunities. And if we're going to speak about the world of art, we were listening to Jasmine, I was thinking of um, how even in that world, it changed because if you think of Kenneth, um, Kenneth Clark's program called Civilization, now I can't expect our audience to necessarily know that, but they want to look it up. This was a very classical, traditional way of looking at art. And then in the 70s came a man called John Berger who said, we need to have a different way of seeing things, just what Jasmine was on about. And seeing things, seeing, looking at the context of art in the sense of the social and political setting, a brand new way of looking at art. And that was quite revolutionary, okay? So I would like to conclude by saying, I have not just let these 10 years go past, I remain connected with South Bank. I'm now chairing the Academy Board, inspiring the youngsters uh, into science, etc. So we've created this family for education. We, we have Lambeth College, we have the university, and we have the schools. So we're trying to um, open up these opportunities even earlier. And what I will also say is, we shouldn't be too worried. I'm an optimist by nature. Technology will create jobs. When I was young and thinking of becoming an accountant, people said, it's a waste of time. There are these new counting machines coming up. There'll be no more need for accountants. And we know that that's not true. There is a huge revolution going on in science, in artificial intelligence. Look at the recent headlines on possibly tackling Alzheimer's, never mind all the new ways that they're looking to uh, deal with COVID. Um, so to me, what I would like to emphasize to students as they leave and make their lives is try to stay connected with South Bank if you can. It's a tremendous family. And when you get older, you look for family, okay? And, and it's a great starting base for networking. Um, the new campaign, and I, I, don't, I don't know how much they expected me to say about it, but it's called No Barriers to Brilliance. And I believe that. If I look at the stories of our panelists, they each thought, hmm, is the world really out there for me? And well, it is. Places like South Bank, who had the, remember, it started in 1892 because a group of locals decided to raise the funds to create this place. There was no help from Carnegie or anybody. It was local change. And that was some of the themes of Christina, really. So um, try to stay connected with LSBU in whatever small way you can. Let's not forget that exceptional world challenges, and they are coming, um, need, uh, will need exceptional students, OK? So keep in touch. and. Um, there was a recent uh, uh, interview or reflection on the work of Anthony Clare. I'm, I'm talking about the way uh, we shouldn't just be too uh, limited in one subject, but Anthony Clare was this famous psychiatrist and they asked him the secrets of happiness. And uh, one of the things he said, and I, and I uh, now asterisk it, is to each of you, be a shining leaf on a magical tree of life, okay? In other words, each leaf is beautiful, but if it's on its own, it will not survive. You are connected 
And I hope that South Bend will be part of that. So I really celebrate this 10 years. Thank you. And thank the organizers. Thank you. Peter, that's a beautiful ending, the shining leaf on the tree. Absolutely love it. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love us to just get through a couple of questions if we can. Um, uh, people have been voting for the questions. Hitesh, would you stay with us for the questions? You may have some answers as well. Um, so the, the question with the most interest appears to be from Hannah Fox, who says, what tips would you give to others for keeping the momentum going, trying to make change happen? And a couple of you have touched on how tiring it can be. So anyone got any tips for keeping the momentum going when you're trying to make change happen? Persevere, work with others so that you're not doing it on your own and build resilience because you need it when you're persevering and when you're trying to change things. Lovely. Anyone else got an add on to perseverance cooperation? Uh, one of my friends, again, it's always a visual thing with me. Uh, I remember I was freaking out about a project and uh, and she, she said, does it's a bit like eating an elephant? I said, what do you mean? She said, you can't eat it in one sitting. You have to have a little bite every day. And I know it sounds silly, but that is a visual thing in my head. I go, okay, I cannot, I can't do all of this in one go. I just have to have little bits and you have a, try and have a really good group of people that you can whinge at regularly and also celebrate with, but you do need to, to let it out. It's important. I, I would say very quickly, um, you know, in my younger days, I used to run a lot of marathons. I've probably run about six in my lifetime. And um, that's probably not a lot. Though. But um, one of the things I always remember is about chip away. When you get to like mile 13 and you're just tired, you're halfway there. And, you know, you're losing that momentum. I just say chip away every mile count. And I, you go down to counting every half mile even. So just keep chipping away and it'll all up. you'll get to the end and yeah. realize that goal. Great. Yeah, if I were to add to that, I would just say it's um, celebrating small wins because it's it's something that you have committed to. There's always been moments that you need that resilience and um, momentum. So it's going to be happening all the way through. So it's making sure. So what has kept, kept me going is when I feel like I'm making progress. If I feel I'm not making progress, what's the point of the change? So when I see the progress that is being made, then it helps you. And of course, making change isn't just about you. It needs to be a community and you feed off from the energy of others that are involved in that and also try to build up support for yourself. Like I've got a coach as well and I've also got a community of others that are also fighting and pushing things that I bounce off on. But you definitely need that resilience and have a resilience toolkit because there will always be that dip in moments where you feel like, is this really all worth it? I've had a time people say, go and get a proper job. I can't understand what you're doing. Why are you doing all of these, you know? But um, it does pay off by seeing the impacts that you're making but also being kind to yourself. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there, but I just want to get through a couple more. So my summing up of that is uh, eat the elephant one bite at a time with the help of other people. Um, the, the next upvoted question, and Michelle, if you can give me one more minute, that would be great. Um, someone says it would be great to hear what Calvin and Christiana think about Black Lives Matter movement and the NSARS movement in Nigeria. Do you think that a new generation of new power change makers will emerge from these movements? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it's what that movement is showing, that is a new power approach because, you know, it, and it, it is an innovative campaign because it actually went viral and it's something that, you know, across the world people can feed into. Mm -hmm. So it's only a new power. <laughs> that can pull that number of people um, together. Um, but one of the things that um, I would say as well is by being a change maker or by those people that are protesting or, or doing that or are passionate about that, and th those are also courses that I also identify with as well, is just making sure that um, you are guided into, so what is what, what is the change that you want to see and what is the impact? Because for me in my organization and being very um, passionate about what I was doing, I was almost like, let's go get them now. Well, you can't go and get them now, you see, that's not the way it works. So I needed to understand, okay, be focused on the impacts that I want to make. So 
I'm guided by that impact. How do I get there? And then I harness that. And I also have an innovative campaign. We also have our hashtag mm -hmm. that we'll run every year. So I needed to make it difficult for anybody to get rid of me. So the NSAS movement and the youth, they need to make it difficult. And how do you do that? Is by continuing that momentum and not just having hashtag Black Lives Matter and it's just all gone. How do you harness that around momentum, around that campaign? And then, then making sure that you're strategic. You do need a bit of strategic focus because it's not just about you. It's about the impact you're trying to make. And by just going, oh, we are here. We need to get rid of everybody and having that infiltrated by some other people that have got different agendas you need to protect that impact you want to make and that means that you need some strategic nurturing and guidance to make sure that you force the hand of the establishment but you um, in order to force that you need to be strategic about making it difficult for them to get rid of you and your and the impact you're trying to make I feel terrible here that I'm about to cut you off when you've said it make it difficult for them to get rid of you <laughs> feeling like the worst panel host in the world <laughs> Calvin, do you have something on this? Um, um, I'll, I'll be generation yeah. of new power. Yeah, I think um, I'm not so sure how much we are a new generation of power. Um, look, even when I did my doctorate, I, I talked about giving voice to African Caribbean women with life after stroke. So we have always been those of us who um, you know have, have been looking at marginalized groups, particularly ethnic minority people. We've always been doing this. Um, it's the fact that it took the death of one more man in a terrible way who said he can't breathe, that the world woke up again to it. So in terms of new power, it's probably renewed, renewed power and energies that the world now begins to focus on what Black lives really matter. And um, I think um, Christina is right, it's how strategic we become, how we harness this. And this is not just Black people's problem. Actually, we need, we need white people to make it their problem. Because when it becomes their problem, then it becomes everybody's problem. Because we know they're the ones in the boardrooms. They're the ones at the top table of organizations who are making these decisions. So that's why when I talk about reverse mentoring, we really need people to understand you know, our positions and what it's like. So when it becomes their problem, it becomes everybody's problem. And that power shifts, it shifts the power balance. <laughs> Excellent. Make it everybody's problem. You're absolutely right. Um, Selesh, Carl, and Fernando, I am sorry that we couldn't find time to take your questions this time, uh, but I've made a note of them and perhaps somebody will be able to get back to you offline. Uh, thank you so much to the panel and to the audience for your wonderful questions. Can I hand you back now to Michelle? Thank you, Kay. And um, I mean, I just want to say, wow, Thank you again to our amazing panelists, your insight and contributions. The way I feel now, inspired, amazed, motivated. I hope everybody else in the audience feels the same. I want to thank Kay. You've done a brilliant job of chairing, no matter what you just said, you have been fantastic. I want to thank Hitesh. Your continued support is amazing, thank you. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us uh, in this new world, this, this virtual event. We hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank Jody. I want to thank Neil and all the rest of the team that actually made this event happen today. Um, I'm sure you all agree. It looks very professional. It's gone fantastically well. We've got to the end, we're out of time. And it's all thanks to the hard work that um, Jody, Neil and the rest of the team have put in. Now, I said this at the beginning, we do events like this because we care about our alumni. In normal times, we'd love to welcome you, give you a drink as well. So hopefully next year, come back, we'll do something else and we'll give you a drink too. Keep your connection to LSBU. Now, one extra little gift. Anyone who joined us live today, you will receive your very own Changemakers Toolkit. Um, that means if you felt inspired, we'll give you a resource, to start your own journey. You'll get a link in an email and we'll just ask you to confirm your address. We'll send that out to you. I wanted to sum up some of the comments from the panelists, but I just, I'm not gonna spend any more time because I'm sure that you all have places to go. I'm just gonna say one thing, which is don't wait for perfect, just put it out there, just go. And I want to hope, I hope that you all feel inspired to go out there and start your change maker journeys, continue your change maker journeys. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck on those change maker journeys and goodbye. <laughs>